So today's agenda is to introduce uh, infrastructure as well to people who are not uh, already familiar with it and also introduce uh, Kulki, which is one of the infrastructure as code tools and also talk about some of the best practices for uh, infrastructure as code and we will also have a short demo where we provision uh, cloud resources in Google. Okay, I think we might have to wait for the next to Uh, 
uh, maybe if you're familiar with the monitoring solution and uh, like data dog, uh, you can create uh, monitors also using Globally. And also if you're uh, familiar with uh, Kong API, you can uh, create uh, the services in Kong using Pulvi. So uh, the concept of uh, state is also very important. Yeah? So it knows what is already present and then you can uh, manipulate based on that. So it has over uh, 100 providers, uh, including Kubernetes or Docker. So you can also create uh, your uh, Kubernetes uh, man, uh, Kubernetes resources using Pulvi. Instead of having to uh, write it in YAML, you can write it in code so that it's more uh, readable. And uh, there's also a concept called uh, policy score. I'm not going to cover about that uh, in, in depth today, but then it is where you can enforce your uh, cloud or your organization's uh, cloud uh, governance policy. So you can mention uh, certain resources have to be created in certain re uh, regions, all of that uh, uh, policies can be enforced using Kubernetes policy as well. Even Terraform has uh, a similar uh, thing. A lot of things, uh, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Terraform, I think I can draw that parallels while explaining uh, Kubernetes. So I just want to see how many of you are familiar with the uh, infrastructure as well. Uh, okay, there's some uh, good number. And also, how many of you are familiar with uh, Terraform? Okay, and I think I can draw some parallels. Uh, okay, how many of you are familiar with the uh, Pulumi, right? Uh, abuse Pulumi. Okay, there's just a couple of hands, so I think uh, uh, I might be able to introduce you to Pulumi. So uh, I'll be drawing a lot of parallels with Terraform since uh, there are some people who are uh, familiar with Terraform. As I go forward, I'll draw some parallels with Terraform. Okay. So before I begin the demo, I'll cover some of the Pulumi concepts that will uh, uh, better help better understand uh, the program that I'll be showing later. So the project in Pulumi, sorry. Uh, so the project in Pulumi is uh, with um, organization of all the uh, source code in uh, Pulumi. So it is just a uh, concept of uh, uh, organizing a uh, directory basically in Pulumi. And uh, the concept of stack is where uh, you can create multiple uh, similar uh, infrastructure uh, using well, just changing a certain value. Uh, a certain configuration. So, there's, uh, for example, if you want the same infrastructure to be created for multiple environments, but with little uh, configuration uh, changes, you can do that with the concept of stacks. You can create a stack for each environment. Or if you want the same uh, infrastructure in multiple cloud regions, but with, li with little changes, you can create a stack for each cloud region and then uh, have a different configuration for each stack. Uh, okay. So, that is, and Terraform also has a similar concept called the workspaces. So, it's the same thing. Uh, resource in uh, Pulumi or in infrastructure as code is uh, any cloud uh, resource such as a virtual machine or uh, uh, load balancer, all of it is a uh, resource. And the provider is uh, a way to communicate with the uh, cloud, uh, uh, with the public cloud or private cloud. So each uh, cloud that, each cloud has its own provider for Pulumi or for Terraform. Um, so for example, AWS has its own uh, provider, Azure has its own provider, so the, those are providers. And uh, the concept of configuration uh, or uh, the secret management in Pulumi is uh, sort of a unique one where uh, you can create uh, configuration, set configurations for each stack that you are working with. And uh, you can also set uh, certain uh, configuration values as secret so that uh, it is encrypted while being stored in the Pulumi uh, backend. That way uh, it is uh, more secure uh, and yeah. So here's what the Pulumi workflow looks like. Uh, you start with uh, setting up a packet. That is you tell Pulumi where to store the state. Uh, there are different options like I mentioned earlier, either on the local system or on any of the clouds uh, object storage. Or also uh, the infrastructure as code uh, uh, providers have their own service. Pulumi has its own service which I'll not be using today because it is only free for individuals and not free for uh, teams. So I'm going to be only using uh, free tools so that uh, this thing can uh, And also, uh, yeah, you mentioned where you want to set up the backend. Even Terraform has also has its own uh, service, uh, similar service like Pulumi. But I'll be using uh, local and Azure uh, block storage for the demo. And uh, the next step is to create a project. So you initialize, you tell Pulumi that uh, a directory is a Pulumi project and then uh, Pulumi creates a file called pulumi.yaml which has all the uh, configuration uh, for that particular project. Uh, specifying Pulumi that this is a Pulumi project and uh, we'll be creating resources in that directory. And the next step is to uh, 
And by creating the project, you can also create a stack. And if you want multiple, you can create multiple stacks while uh, creating the project as well. Uh, and the next step is to deploy the stack. So once you deploy the stack using pull me up command, uh, command uh, there's a command line tool for pull me, uh, for pull me, and you use, use that to uh, interact with pull me. And uh, yeah, you uh, deploy the stack using pull me up. And when you run pull me up, there are two options. Either you can preview what, what is being deployed, and then uh, confirm the deployment, or you can directly deploy it as well. And finally, you get the output. So pull me, pull me, you can export certain things as output. For example, if you create uh, a um, container uh, or any load balancer, you can uh, get the output uh, as you can set the uh, IP address of the load balancer as the uh, output, and uh, you can view that output uh, using pull me as well, or using the uh, cloud providers support as UI. Alright, so let's jump into the uh, jump into the demo. So I'll be using. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be using uh, Pulumi's examples repo, which has a bunch of examples for uh, the different uh, uh, cloud providers and different uh, languages. Okay, uh, before I begin with uh, that, I will. Uh, Play around with a few Kulumi commands just to uh, show how uh, Kulumi functions. So, a new project in Kulumi is uh, created using Kulumi new project, and then uh, it gives an option of uh, okay, it is asking me to log in first. Right. So, the first step was to set up the backend. So I'll uh, set up the backend on a local file uh, using full login. Okay, so this uh, I've used the uh, local file part of dot full uh, stack. Stack can be any uh, directory on your local machine. So this is one of the ways to set up a backend. Now, now that I have logged in as uh, my local user uh, into a local file, I will be creating a new project uh, in this directory. And you can also check uh, who is the current uh, user. If you are if you are using multiple Pulumi accounts, you can check who you are logged in as. So right now, I uh, logged in as my local uh, system user. And now I will uh, create a new project. So while Uh, 
I'll stop this. I think uh, it's just because of this slow network that I have for the second time. So uh, I'll get back to the Kulumi example uh, repo, and then uh, we'll create uh, an Azure uh, container instance using uh, Kulumi. I uh, go to the code. Uh, so this is the directory that I am interested in, the Azure uh, Go ACI. It has a pull me. It has a pull me dot yaml file, which Azure is done through the Azure uh, CLI AZ. 
I've already logged in uh, to my account, uh, so that's how we work to you know, how to communicate with the cloud provider. I think that's a very really important thing that I missed. But uh, yeah, that's how uh, Kuli knows to communicate with the cloud provider. Uh, and one of the uh, configuration that the Azure provider expects is the uh, location. So I'll be setting the location as well. So the uh, Kuli config set uh, is the command used to set uh, the location for uh, or set the configuration. It's the same command to set uh, secrets as well. Uh, so while uh, setting secrets, uh, you pass the secret flag. But since this is not a secret, I'll be just uh, setting it as a regular uh, uh, configuration parameter. So now uh, I'll be using the dev stack. It's already have us. OK, now the uh, configuration is set for the dev stack. If you go back to the directory uh, where we have all the files, So there's a new uh, file that was created, fullme uh, dev.yaml. So this has all the configuration that we have uh, defined for that particular stack. So this is how we can use multiple stacks. It creates its own uh, file for each stack, fullme.stackme.yaml, uh, and it will uh, have all the key value base of uh, the configuration that you set. In case you uh, set, it, set any configuration as a secret, it will be included in this file uh, using that password that we earlier uh, provided. It now so pull me up should now create the, the cloud container instance. Okay, it's asking for the password that we set earlier in order to access the backend. Okay, this is a new stack. So it will either be it will give uh, two options. That is one to one is to preview what uh, is being uh, deployed, and another is to actually deploy it. Uh, so it will list on what are uh, the resources that we will create so that we can uh, audit what is being created before it is actually created. Okay, so it is showing that it will create a stack at the first uh, and that is not really a cloud resource that is being created. But then after that it is creating a list, uh, it will create a resource group and then also a container uh, instance. So I uh, will uh, first look at the details. So in the details it will uh, show what is exactly being deployed, the complete uh, configuration uh, with all the variable uh, interpolation that is being done uh, inside the code. We'll be able to see that. Uh, so we deploy the HIX image. Uh, okay. Now I'll uh, select yes, actually deploy this onto Azure. Creating uh, the three resources. Uh, one of them is the pull list stack, the other is the resource group and container group. This is also a few of the uh, differences between the infrastructure as code and cloud SDKs. In infrastructure as code tools, you get to know what exactly is being deployed, and a uh, lot of tools have the option of previewing it before uh, you deploy. But in cloud SDKs, it can be previous because so it directly deploys because you are the one uh, who is defining uh, the resources to be cloud SDK. Just taking time probably due to my network. Uh, okay, so uh, while this happens, I'm not sure if I'll be able to uh, demo the. Okay, this happened. So it outputs the uh, container IP, like we mentioned earlier, it exports the uh, container uh, IP once it is created. Uh, if I curl this, we'll be able to see the default JNX uh, page. So that's how we know uh, the container was created and uh, this was the IP for the container. You can also look at the uh, container uh, IP once, even after uh, the Command is executed. We will pull the output. Uh, yeah, this command to get the output. Uh, pull the stack also. Right.
So once again, asking for the password to access the uh, pattern. And uh, it means the same output that we have And now, uh, to delete this entire uh, resource that we've just created, you know, uh, there's a simple command as pull me as well. So it's as simple as uh, running one single command to delete the entire infrastructure that you created. Uh, and once again, you can uh, either uh, look at what is being deployed or directly confirm the destruction. Uh, <coughs> so once again, uh, if we look at if we call the same IP address, right, uh, we should not be able to get any output because uh, the infrastructure is deleted. So that's how uh, you can maintain your infrastructure as well, infrastructure as well, so that uh, you can uh, you get a lot of uh, the benefits that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this time, it will take more. So I will uh, set this for now. So I think, uh, are there any questions? So, uh,
creating a storage container or the cloud storage container uh, in Azure called the ISC scale. So this is where I'll be using uh, the packet for uh, the next demo. And uh, finally, to log in uh, to Pulumi using uh, that Azure uh, cloud storage. So Pulumi login and then followed by what backend that you want to use. There are a uh, few options that Pulumi allows. One of them is the Azure cloud storage. And once again, Pulumi is communicating with the Azure cloud storage using uh, uh, two important variables that I have set here, uh, that is the Azure storage key and the Azure uh, storage account. So these two important variables are necessary for uh, Pulumi to communicate with the uh, Azure cloud storage for the packet. And now that we have logged in uh, with uh, the Azure cloud storage as a packet, I will once again run the same thing, but I will create a new stack uh, for this uh, particular uh, uh, demo. I will uh, create a new uh, stack called staging. So once again, asking for a password to encrypt uh, the backend. Right, uh, so we have uh, created a new uh, stack called the staging. And once again, uh, like any other stack, it has created a file called uh, pullv.staging.yaml. This is very uh, of the configuration and uh, the IP related to the stack. And now, once again, we will need to actually set the Azure, loca uh, Azure location uh, for the stack. So, by default, uh, it was uh, using the staging stack. That's how uh, it was to set for the staging stack. Now, if I look at Pulumi stack list. So it is. Uh, it just has one stack uh, for this particular packet, and uh, the star indicates that that is the active uh, stack. So that's how uh, Pulumi knew to set this uh, configuration for the staging stack. And now uh, the similar command of uh, running Pulumi up will now create uh, Azure uh, Cloud instance. It's just a uh, same thing, but I'm uh, using a different backend just to demonstrate how you can use uh, different backends. And if you do not provide any backend, that is, if you just run Pulumi login, it will uh, try to use the Pulumi's uh, service, which I am not using for this particular uh, meter because it is a sort of a paid service, so I do not want to demonstrate that. But yeah. That is uh, running the same thing basically. So I'll uh, go back to the slides and continue with them. So uh, now we saw that now we saw how uh, infrastructure as code can be deployed with Pulumi. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the best practices for infrastructure as code. Uh, one of the major uh, best practices is to uh, follow the software engineering principles uh, that you follow for your regular uh, code into the, the infrastructure as code. That is uh, using version control or uh, performing code reviews and continuous uh, testing and uh, continuous development. Uh, that is uh, doing all the actions in a CACD uh, manner in, in the CACD instead of uh, having to manually run pull me up uh, on, from your local. Uh, and also uh, the secret management. Uh, so identify the right secrets that are uh, in your uh, application, in your infrastructure as code uh, uh, program. Uh, that is all the credentials for your database or any uh, such uh, confidential uh, data should be uh, managed using the secret man management tool. Uh, you can use, in case of Pulumi, it does handle its uh, secrets uh, with the configuration uh, secret management. But if you are using other infrastructure as code tools, you can use uh, an external uh, uh, encryption vault, uh, such as the HashiCorp vault or uh, the AWS secret manager, any of those. Uh, that's a good practice to have. And finally, uh, creating modular uh, codes or reusable codes. So, for example, if you have uh, uh, any resource that can be used uh, in multiple other resources in your uh, entire uh, infrastructure, it is a good idea to make it modular so that it uh, can be reused and uh, basically following, once again, it comes down to following the software engineering principles of uh, maintaining it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's about uh, some of the best practices that I have listed out here, but they are uh, obviously uh, more to uh, Let's see if uh, the resource will actually deploy. Here it goes. If I run the call command once again, uh, 
which will be the same output of the range x and x. Right, so just uh, talk about two different ways of using the backend tool and deploying uh, cloud resources. And it is not just uh, limited to uh, the public cloud like Azure or other ones like I mentioned earlier. So you can use it for uh, Docker or creating a Docker container or uh, deploying resources to your Kubernetes cluster or even uh, creating other resources such as it will be actually go to one of the uh, go to the Udemy's providers page, so it will uh, give a better idea about that. Uh, Right. 
I think uh, that is one of the ways to do it. I am not sure if I answered it uh, right, so I did not really exactly visualize the entire structure that you mentioned, but then I think having one main, dot main uh, file and then uh, that column the other modules is uh, good idea. things I didn't know, the things because of which I didn't know, I got confused, pitfalls I had, um, some fun misunderstandings in the community, etc. Um, so a little bit about me, I tend to get very excited about systems and stuff, so like if you come talk to me, uh, expect like a random squeal because I get excited about that stuff. I work at VMware, uh, over there I work on the Kubernetes upstream team, so we contribute to Kubernetes full time. Um, within the Kubernetes community, I work in a few different areas, mainly API machinery, uh, scalability architecture, and contributor experience. And if any of you here would like to get started in the community, uh, you want to contribute something, you know, like, please reach out to me. Uh, happy to help out however I can. And I've been doing stuff with Go for about three years now, uh, and I particularly love things in, around the Go runtime. Um, so, I, before we get here, right? Like, I don't want to be presumptuous of anything. Is there anyone here who might not be familiar with what Kubernetes is? Like, it's, I'm happy to give like a one-minute short overview so that everyone is on the same page while we go ahead with the talk. Is there anyone like that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, did someone raise their hand? Okay. Hi. Uh, so, uh, a quick overview, right? Like, let me go to this diagram before we go to the agenda. Um, on a very high level, this is the overall architecture of Kubernetes. You have like this main central thing that everyone talks to, it's called the API server. Then you have a backing store, which is the source of all truth, the all-knowing at CD. Um, that's where you basically say that, you know what, this is what I want my cluster to look like um, at a certain point of time. And then everything else in the Kubernetes machinery sort of works towards that. Um, nothing talks to etcd directly, everything talks to the API server, and the API server then talks to etcd. Uh, the API server is just a fancy REST API server. Um, Kubernetes is basically just a REST API at the end of the day. Um, it has a few things, very uh, elegant things, some very ugly things uh, internally to sort of optimize for things. Uh, a few of which I'll be talking about today, elegant or ugly, like that's 
on your point of view. Uh, if you're an end user, it might be ugly. If you're a person building it, it might be elegant. So like, I'm sorry for making your lives harder in the future. Um, so, and there's this concept of controllers in Kubernetes. Uh, or the, everything in Kubernetes is controlled by something known as a controller. Um, the easiest way to understand a controller is by thinking of, like, let's say, a thermostat. Uh, you set the temperature to, let's say, I want my room to be 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, it senses that the room is at 23 degrees Celsius, and it says that okay, my desired state is 25. I need to adjust the degree. I need to adjust the temperature by 2 degrees. So, like on a very, 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 very high level, naive overview, that's what a controller does, and that's what everything in Kubernetes is. So, like you have a bunch of controllers here. You have a scheduler. You have a deployment controller. You have a replica set controller. Uh, you have a controller called the cube light. All of these are basically controllers. Uh, we don't need to get into details of this, but this is what the high level overview is of Kubernetes. Um, having said that, the agenda for today is as follows. Uh, we we'll look, we'll take a look at how something known as watches work in Kubernetes from a very high level. Um, then we'll zoom in just a little bit to see how it's internally implemented so that we're able to uh, sort of gauge the issues that existed uh, till now in the watch cache, uh, a component called the watch cache, which helps with watches. Uh, subsequently, we'll talk about what the initial solution to the problem we thought it was. And like, uh, as most uh, brainstorming sessions are, as most solutions go, the initial problem, the initial solution was highly over-engineered, highly complicated, not required. Uh, then like, boils down to something more simple and like, better to use, better to implement, better to test all of that. And then uh, we'll talk about how making that change is beneficial and like, how it helps. So like, a few interesting results. I tried to pull out a few benchmarks from the API server and put it in here. OK, so um, overview, as I said, this is the overall architecture of Kubernetes. So there is this really interesting concept in Kubernetes called the watch. Um, the whole idea of the watch mechanism is that you can tell Kubernetes that, hey, you know what? Give me all changes that a particular object has gone through since a point in time. So what this allows you to do is, if a particular object was created, um, and you have written, again, a controller, which sort of, its job now is to react to these changes. So as I said earlier, if the temperature in the room drops, the thermostat knows what to do. Um, so what this allows you to do is, a watch creates like a persistent stream of changes that you get. So if anything in Kubernetes changes for the particular resource or object that you care about, watch will tell you that something has happened. So you can get an add event that something got created. And if something did get created, you can react to it. Like you can, I don't know, maybe update a dashboard or do something about something created. Or you can get, an, you get update events. So like if something got updated, how do you react to that? Then you also get delete events. So something got deleted, how do you react to that? So this is like a watch is like a consistently, it's a persistent stream that's open. Uh, and like it streams all of these changes to you. So all of these controllers in Kubernetes internally that you write yourself, uh, all of them make use of the watch mechanism to do this. And uh, also a little bit of like interesting context here is that all, almost all controllers, they read from a local cache, but they write directly to etcd. Um, the whole point of doing this is, was because we don't want to load the API server because this is like a central point where everything is communicated. So if you keep reading all of these things from the API server and you keep sending in requests, it's not going to happen. So like uh, a little bit, like going just a little deeper here, all of these controllers have local caches, which gets, which reflects the state in etcd through the watch mechanism. So if something changes there, it gets propagated to the cache, and then the controller reads the cache rather than directly reading the API server, which would cause a lot of load there. And writes obviously happen directly uh, there. So not relevant, but like you know, it's fun, so why not? Um, so zooming in a little bit, so that's how watches work. And when I say a point in time, I mean something known as the resource version. Uh, so the resource version is a field in etcd which is populated, and what Kubernetes uses. So what is important to know about the resource version is it's a monotonically increasing uh, number. So you, uh, if I have an object x at a certain point, it will have a resource version. Uh, if the same object gets updated, 
it'll have a resource version that is greater, basically. So you can think of it like a logical clock of sorts. So at a point uh, t plus 1, the resource version is going to be greater than at the point t of that particular object. Uh, so you can tell that watch everything from a resource version x, and then everything beyond that resource version is what you're going to get an update notification stream for. So zooming in a little bit, um, so prelude, how was the watch mechanism implemented in the early days of Kubernetes? That is like before all of this fancy jazz came in. How did they implement it like way earlier on? That is in the first two to three years of Kubernetes. So you have the API server. Whenever a watch request used to come in, the API server used to open watch request to etcd. Um, and watch is something that etcd supports natively, uh, which is why like Kubernetes adopted it in the first place. So initially, every watch request used to open a new request, a new connection to etcd for serving the watch. Um, because of which, each watch ends up doing its own serialization, deserialization, depending on if you're storing it in whatever format. Um, and likely, each of them would do it duplicately. Like if you are even getting updates for the same object, you are still doing the same serialization, deserialization over and over again redundantly. Uh, so this was one issue. This is still not solved by the way, so like, you know, contributions like them. Uh, the other issue is that you're opening multiple watches all the time. Uh, and right now in Kubernetes there are so many controllers that work on just the watch mechanism, so this basically wasn't uh, scalable after a point. So the current design, that is before the change that I'm going to talk about got merged, um, is as follows. So you have a component in the API server called the cacher, which sort of gets asynchronously populated through etcd, and the watches are now served through the cacher. So now you are reducing the load on etcd uh, by putting on putting in this like putting in this middle cacher layer. Uh, this has its disadvantages. As I said, it's elegant for me. It might be a pain point for an end user, right? So considering it's a cache, you always have the problem of um, Stale reads, right? So that's always there, and there has been a lot of work that's gone into making sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, but there are still a lot. Of, uh, there are still a few pain points. Hopefully, it should be resolved in the next two releases. I'll talk a little bit about those that future work towards the end. Um, so there's the cacher. The client is open. Watches get served through the cacher. Going one step below as uh, again. Uh, so as I said, this populated asynchronously. The reason I scratched this out is because I realized uh, last night that object serializations are still not cached. So you are still doing it redundantly, which is why I said like if anyone wants to, you know, help out, uh, please reach out. Uh, so this is not done yet, but you are reducing load on it. So thumbs up there. One step deeper, the cacher component uses something known as the watch cache, which is just a circular buffer of sorts. Um, and then there is a store. So the asynchronous population that I mentioned gets populated here. And from the store, the watch cache takes events and serves the watches uh, as and when required. The reason for doing it this way is because this is the standard pattern for writing most controllers. That is, you have a packing store, and then you have another layer of cache if needed. Uh, this is circular in nature because it's easier to do some of the internal machinery that's implemented right now, and that it's also dynamically sized. So like, as and when uh, events come into the watch cache, if it feels like it's about to go full, it resizes it up to a certain limit, and then uh, shrinks it down as well as needed. Um, so the watch cache is what we are mainly going to focus on today. So that's the main component right there. Um, so you have a cache component, you have the watch cache, and then you have the store. The store is basically a Golang map with a lock on top. Uh, that's basically all it is. Um, on top of that, they've, in, they've implemented like a few indexing mechanisms to sort of try and optimize a little more so that you don't end up doing redundancy similar to how like indexes and databases work. Uh, this is part of the future work that I'll talk about towards the end. But WatchCap is what we focus on for now. Um, okay, so what's the problem, right? Like, that looks, that looks nice and fancy and um, pretty cool to talk about, so what went wrong? Now, 
let's say we start a watch with us. Let's say we start a watch saying, you know what, uh, start the watch from resource hotel three. Now I've just like put three events here, but like the event is the events are in the in the scale of like hundreds of thousands, basically, uh, even more typically. Uh, so just for the sake of demonstration purposes, like illustration purposes, you have three events here. So when you say this, internally what's going to end up happening is uh, you allocate a buffer. So you first find out where resource version 3 or greater is in the watch cache because you only care about henceforth. You don't care about the previous ones. So finding that resource version out is not too difficult. Uh, you, it uses binary search or like not too slow. Uh, so once you do find that out, you allocate a buffer for the required number of events that are going to send out. Uh, you allocate the buffer, you copy over each element, and then you send that buffer out, basically. And this is what you get served back to you. Um, but this uh, is a concurrent data structure. That is, there are going to be multiple coroutines that are going to be accessing this. So what this means is, uh, this copying over that needs to happen needs to be synchronized in some form. Uh, so because of that, you the watch cache holds a lock, and once the lock is held, let's say go to pin zero holds the lock, it's copying over things. Now, as I said, these are just three events, but typically you're going to have events in the order of thousand. Uh, so now what's going to happen is under the lock, you are allocating the buffer, you are copying over events, and you know if binary search proves to be slow for you, you are also binary search. You're also doing the binary search in that under the lock. What this means is, not only do you have a lot of lock contention, but you also end up with um, an unpredictable memory footprint. Because let's say here you have three events, in another watch you have five events, in another watch you have 100 events. What this means is, this buffer size is going to be allocated. You can't really predict what it's going to be. And once you have uh, your API server running in locations where you really care about the memory footprint or you really care about what the pattern of the memory footprint is going to look like so that you can optimize and sort of better deploy it. Um, this really matters. So right now, it's like kind of haywire. Your buffer size can be uh, five events or it can be thousand events, like there's no predicting that. Um, so that's one issue. Other issue is lock condition. And another issue is all of the memory allocations and copying over that happens under the lock. Uh, and all this while, other watches are blocked. So, when I say copying over, as I said, it includes uh, allocating the buffer size, iterating over the list of items, copying it over, keeping in mind all of this happen under a lock, and all, all, and these waiting routines in turn will have their own copying to do. So once that lock gets freed, something else will come, have the same lock. You know, uh, the number of events it has to copy over can be even more. For example, so. Uh, that's another. Like, you, that's not a very nice scenario, and these aren't very common things that happen. These happen at typically at big scale, but when they do happen, it can be hard to reason about, and you know your memory footprint can go up by a lot. So it's not that these are issues that happen almost all the time if you run Kubernetes. Uh, so these were discovered when you were when you were running scalability tests on uh, the scale of 500 to 1000 nodes. So that's when these, these problems became evident. So it's not like if this change didn't go in, like all of the Kubernetes clusters are like, you know, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go home. Like it's not like that. It's that, but when these do happen, we need to sort of be careful about that. Um, because of this, we end up with spikes in memory consumption open <coughs> against the quote unquote pass. And what I mean by pass is when you sort of, uh, when I said open watch from resource version, Basically, that is something that is not the latest one. So uh, when I said three earlier, there was already four, five, six. So like that's called opening a watch against the past. So that's when these problems are become uh, probability of the, these problems occurring increases in those cases. Uh, the solution. So I'm just going to talk about the solution we ended up doing. The initial proposal was uh we have like a p tree and then we keep track of like what indices are happening what ratio versions are going in and we're like why is this like so insanely complicated this is going to increase memory consumption is that a trade-off we're willing to make probably not 
So, and there was a much simpler one because of the ring buffer, because of the watch cache being a ring buffer, and like that sort of simplified things a lot for us. So the solution is, um, don't copy over everything under the law. Introduce an interval that, that tells us what we want to copy over. So that's called the watch cache interval. Uh, introduce an interval for that. The interval basically consists of a start index, an end index, which points to the interval of events we care about. Um, so now, get the start and the end. This is your data structure now. And you send that over, release the lock. Um, the entity which cares about getting these events, let that get it whenever it wants under the lock that it's holding, not this lock. So you're, basically, you're not allocating buffers here. You are not copying under the lock. Uh, you are just sending over a data structure with some metadata in it. Um, however, I said you are not allocating buffers here. That is not true. This has a buffer allocated internally, but that is a buffer of constant size of 100 elements. Uh, so no matter if your watch cares about 1,000 elements, or if your watch cares about 5 elements, 10 elements, the allocation you're going to go through is 100 constant, 100 events constant. So like now you have a predictable memory footprint as well because you're now going through like a constant uh, allocation over there. Uh, the reason we also allocate a buffer internally is to further optimize things internally. So because this also has a lock, like everything is concurrent, so like we need to have a lock here. Uh, so to reduce lock contention in the watch cache interval, we sort of allocate uh, the buffer. So like extremely meta, but like it works. Um, so over here, popping over includes calculating the start and end indices, uses binary source, so that's pretty fast. Um, allocating an internal buffer of constant size. This means uh, we limit the memory consumption for watches from the past to a constant amount. In most cases, uh, there is still one, there, are, there is still a, a very small number of cases where this solution still might not help. Uh, so if you work with lists and watches in Kubernetes, uh, there is this case of resource version zero. Um, resource version zero has a, a conflicted meaning in the Kubernetes history. So right now, you need to specify resource version zero as, zero as a string, as opposed to not specifying anything to for the watch to work a certain way, as opposed to another way. And they had to do this like workaround because uh, they wanted to maintain backward compatibility between clusters for end users. Right? Um, part of the future work I'm going to talk about next, so getting rid of the 1% as well and like, optimizing it end to end. So not done yet, hopefully soon. Um, but in this case, the performance does not degrade. It does not, you don't get the performance benefit, but also it remains the same. So you're not like, it's not like you're regressing anyone else just because of this optimization. Um, so we talked about the watch cache interval. We talked about how we calculate the start and the end, and then someone who cares about this pop asynchronously gets the events from the watch cache interval using, uh, I don't think I talked about that. Yeah, you have this interval exposes this one API called next. Uh, so you can just do interval.next in a loop till you get an error or a nil event. And then you basically asynchronously get all the events and populate it uh, under a different lock or under no lock, depending on who's calling it. Um, but considering it's happening async, there are still considerations to have. Um, so, considering this happens async, what do we keep in? What do we need to keep in mind, right? So, a little bit before we talk about that, a few things to know. So, the circular buffer I talked about, if that becomes full, uh, the watch cache then pops out an element, which is what caches usually do. So, like pops out the element, um, and this is the the term for this is called propagation. So, the watch cache is propagating. So when you, as in when you pop out elements, the watch cache propagates. Um, the event to be popped off is kept, is tracked by an index called start index. Uh, the watch cache interval also has a start index. This is a different one, same name, for some reason. Uh, I should not have put the same name, but it's merged, so like, that's not that's that. Uh, so the interval tracks the event to be served also using a similar index. So these are three things you need to know, and like, I'll tell you why. So consider we have the watch cache, right? There's still a ring buffer, but like let's say you flatten it out because it's easier to draw this way. 
uh, you flatten it out and like let's say you have the watch cache. Now with the watch cache, you have the start index which keeps track of what you want to pop off because like think of it like a ring buffer and that's the first element that's where anyone pops that off. Uh, that's the start index. Now you also have the watch cache interval which has a start index and an end index. These are the events that it cares about over here. And like it asynchronously gets them and does things with them. Um, <coughs> now if propagation happens faster than the interval serves events, right? So what does this mean? If the watch cache ends up popping events faster than the next, the interval dot next is called, what's going to happen then? So this is something we need to be very careful about. Um, so let's say the propagation happened, propagation happened, propagation happened. So now you have the star index here and you have the watch cache interval here. What this essentially now means is all events from here are not there and the watch cache is only valid from the start index. So only from here is what you care about. Uh, which means the interval is now in a position which is an invalid area of the watch cache. So this is something we all, like we need to be careful in how we handle is what I'll like I'll tell you why. So interval is invalid and we mark the interval as invalidated. And once an, in, an interval is called is, is marked as invalidated, you basically can't use it anymore. Even if you try calling dot next, it will return, return an error um, to that API. So once it's invalidated, uh, we stop the watch. So uh, there were a few design there were a few decisions to make here. Do we stop the watch completely? That is, do we break off the watch? Um, or in watch, when you open a watch, there's another error you get called resource to over expire. What this means is the watch cache is stale enough that you probably should try opening another watch. So that's the error you get. So resource to over expire. So that makes more sense to tell here because the interval we care about is not valid and the interval the window of the watch cache is basically propagated forward. So we are now way ahead in time and you are still sort of stuck behind. So you need to do something about that. So expired makes sense, but we need to also take care of custom clients and users that use the watch mechanism. Uh, the resource to word expired is not an error that the watch cache originally emits. So emitting an error like this for a custom client can be new behavior and can be a breaking change. So we don't want to do that. We, we can't break Kubernetes clients. Like it's, we get sued and I won't have money in my bank anymore. So uh, what we end up doing is we stop the watch. This was an acceptable trade-off for the following reasons. Um, we typically, most custom clients or most clients use the watch through something known as the reflector. In, the Kubernetes client library, there's something known as a reflector. Um, the reflector is basically like a wrapper over the Kubernetes client, which sort of helps with these uh, initializing watches. And more importantly, it has retry mechanisms in built. So once the watch is stopped, the reflector automatically will reopen the watch. And once the watch is reopened, if that validity is still not corrected, then it will return a resource to word expired because now you are uh, getting a resource to word expired from another component and which is not the watch cache. Uh, that is the component that the reflector talks to. So this is same as the original behavior. The only trade-off is that you are going to have to reinitialize the watch. And that seemed acceptable considering we aren't, we aren't going to break anyone. So uh, that's what we sort of went with. Um, so we stopped the watch and the interval is invalidated. And uh, that was the whole sort of end-to-end -end solution that we implemented, right? Uh, I feel like I've been talking way too much. Uh, like, is, does this make sense so far? Uh, any questions before I show up the results? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. You were saying. You were saying something like the watch test, which holds a set of keys or something. You, you end up today, you'll be giving a metadata if it's not a key. Is it a metadata means uh, some resource key version that way? Right? So, under why why we need a log? Under is it a 
Uh, so the watch cache holds the events itself. The watch cache interval, the additional async thing that I told about, that holds only metadata. Um, and metadata as in just like what what interval of the watch cache we care about. The watch cache holds events itself. It doesn't hold just metadata. So once you call dot next, it's going to get the event from the watch cache itself, not from NCT. So because of that, we need to hold uh, the lock on that. Okay, the index, um, yeah. literally calls the cache. Like, it, it gets the event from the cache, exactly, yeah. yeah. So basically, there is, uh, there is an option leaving under, that is what yeah. uh, this is, the next will do, right? You, so right now, the watch cache uh, <coughs> does support limits, uh, and that is sub functional right now, but there is another thing in Kubernetes called continue. Mm. Uh, so if you specify continue, this whole watch cache thing will just be bypassed and the request will be served from NCT directly. Because watch cache does not support that functionality yet. Uh, so if you do specify a limit, limit will be sort of, um, but limit is part of a list request. The watch is a different one. So like watch just gives you a stream of events to sort of act on. If you, if you, if you open a list request, that's when uh, you can specify a limit parameter and then limit the number of objects that you care about and things like that. But with the watch, uh, you just like you're opening a stream basically. Okay. So I have another question. So this watch cache is there, right? So there are multiple resources and tools. Yeah. So you're saying that the start end, the start end will be will be the same in the Let's say I'm watching for a power resource. Then in the there could be multiple resources can they would be there in cache? Yeah. How the start end be? It could be a single startup, right? Is it a, this cache per resource type? Or? This cache is not per resource type. Uh, it is one cache which is populated with all events. Uh, so this is something that I'm not sure of, but I, this is my current understanding. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, the when you open a watch, it returns like a channel to you. Yes. And the the. the this is not the channel that you end up using. There's a channel which is returned to another component, the cache of the other one. I think that's when like you sort of see what you care about in that level. So the watch cache just returns the channel, and then the cacher then sort of sees is the resource version greater than what I requested for. If yes, this this is a candidate for me to care about, and then other sort of uh, filters. But like again, this is not something I'm hundred percent sure. I can we can check and get back. When, when you're saying that uh, your uh, the starting basis moved beyond the one which you had uh, which you had uh, returned, right? You can still get those events from next year. You can cache, essentially a cache list. Yeah, you can say get from. So why do you say that uh, the resource is too old and other things should be? Okay, uh, so the resource too old originally was returned from the cacher layer and not the watch cache layer. Uh, so when you say a resource is too old, it can mean that you didn't find the resource version in the watch cache itself. So that was the intention of saying that. Uh, and what that, what that was interpreted to be was the resource version that you are trying to find in the buffer is basically gone out now. So you're trying, you're asking for a resource version that is old. And that's what it meant. Uh, <coughs> That's when you return that error. Now, when we say that you want to stop the cache, you want to stop the watch and not return that error, we say that here because here you are serving the watch uh, initially and right, like in between, you're returning that resource to world expired. Uh, that time, originally, what used to happen is you return the resource to world before you even use the watch. So here you might use a certain event, a few events, and then you get there. So that's something that might not be expected from the previous behavior. You can't get those from You can if you want to. You can if you want to. But um, then you have to make that separate which you about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If you do care about those events, you can get it from NCT. It, it's always there. This is just the caching event. Uh, we don't modify etcd in any way uh, through the watch cache. Watch cache is just meant for reading from the client side. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so you said that there is a post in our creator environment. I'm sorry? In the creator environment. Okay. So there is a post in our creator environment. So there is a 
information goes to the city, yeah. then this information comes to watch as it. Yes. And if I, if I am not sure about the I am not sure about the concept of watch as it, it will become from my country, it will be more than a million years ago. So instead of going to actually, it will first go to watch as it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's correct. So uh, when the request sort of enters the API server, mm -hmm. there are a few what Kubernetes calls as filters it runs through. Uh, so first, it will reach the watch cache. Mm -hmm. Then if it's because of a few conditions, if it's not able to serve it from the watch cache, it goes to etcd directly. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is the case with like single object get requests. I'm not sure if they are directly served. And now let's suppose if I increase the data size to 10. So it will take some time to propagate those changes to watch cache? That is correct. Will uh, it is, considering it's a cache being populated over a network, there is always going to be delays. Hi. Uh, Hi. So one you described this is a single instance of API server. So most probably the control plane is having multiple API server instances. So are the cacher, is it seen across the replicas? Or it is not. So is it rebuilt then if the switch off happens, how is that problem solved in multi API server? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, right now, this is not replicated or solved for multi API server. Um, the okay, so in Kubernetes there is a thing called KEPs, uh, Kubernetes enhancement proposals. The KEP which which hopes to implement support for multi API server, or if it's not implemented, why is it not implemented and what's the acceptable trade-off? It's called API list chunking. That is sort of being worked on for the next release or two. And that problem is going to be solved as part of that. So right now it's not, for sure. Yeah. So this problem is solved, uh, which one? 1.24, as of 1.24 it's solved. It's solved. Yeah, this part. Yeah. OK, uh, any more questions, or we can move on to results? No. Actually, yeah. the cache is when you're showing, you have a problem with watch cache and so. Yes. So when HCD, uh, when I showed like it asynchronously populates, it gets populated to the store okay. directly. And then WatchCast takes it from the store and serves it. Okay. And like, you showed a separate Docker, like, which has less 100, uh, 100 events. The 100 events is the WatchCast interval that I talked about. Okay. Yeah. Is yeah. it customizable? Or? Uh, so just this has 100 events. Okay. The constant buffer. Yeah, it's constant. It's, it's not customizable. It's not. It's not. So 100 was uh, the number we chose initially. Uh, it is subject to fine tuning. But the, the, the idea is to not make it uh, dynamic, because we want like a constant memory and predictable footprint. And secondly, we also don't want to allocate a very huge buffer, because in case the watch serves a small number of events, then you are <laughs> allocating way more than it would have previously. So you, you want to be in like that uh, sweet spot over there. Sorry? What happens when the buffer is free? Buffer is freed up. Yeah. Which buffer? Uh, the 100 events? The 100. Okay. Um, so when you call next, uh, it first checks if the buffer is filled or not. If it's not filled, it fills it under a log because we want to hold a log only once. Uh, and then remaining of the times you just serve from the buffer. Once it becomes empty, it fills it again. So you are essentially holding a log every 100th call of next. Not every call of next. So like optimize it a little more, basically. OK, all good. We can start with the results then. OK, uh, so few basic benchmarks. So this was a benchmark that was uh, run in the API server to sort of get, this was the worst case benchmark. To get all possible watch events from the starting of the cluster, so like you are allocating, you are serving as many events as possible. So this is the worst case scenario. And in the worst case scenario, you have uh, allocations happening here, which yeah. So old allocs, new allocs. You have 890 KB. After the change, you have a constant one KB. One KB is because like 100 events. So that, that's the size it comes up. So you, you have a one-kilogram allocation, uh, old dialogs. So this is where 
you have three new allocations constantly. This is because you are returning like a data structure which is a pointer and that object that by default Go puts it on the heap rather than on the stack. Uh, so because of that you have three extra allocations over here so that's the downside. So if you do care about that, um, there might be ways to fix it which I haven't been able to think of yet. Uh, an acceptable way to fix it rather. And even if you see the CPU time, right? Uh, that takes 1.17. I couldn't even measure the time length. Maybe the benchmark isn't probably very good. So if, if you're getting 0, 0.0 there. But you do get some improvement. The, the, the considerable significant improvements are in the allocations here. Um, so moving on, the memory uses as we saw 819 KB and one. This is the worst case. I'll show like a few uh, middle cases as well. After this. So <coughs> this is what I pulled out yesterday. Um, so if you if you look at uh, three fourths of the events, that is like you get you request a watch from um, basically you, you would, if you want to get the if you want to get the number of events that are one fourth or like the end one fourth events, so like um, the remaining towards the end quarter of events that you care about. So if that's the case, you get allocations around. 20 KP, 20 K, uh, 20 KP here, um, and then if you want half the events, you get the allocation over here. If you want one fourth, that is, if you request at like the point which is one fourth of the history, that is basically three fourths of the remaining events, you get over here, and then if you want all, you get that. Um, but the point of doing this was to show that depending on what your resource version is, your memory footprint is going to be that. Uh, so it's not going to be a constant thing, but because of the change, you have a constant one zero two four, basically. So that, that's the point of this graph. Um, then, like, you have a few memory. I don't think that's visible that on it. But uh, if you take a memory profile of that benchmark, this is the function which is getting all that, and the number here reads uh, three nine one five nt. I'm not sure. That's not visible, right? Like, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but that reads three nine one five. And that's the basically the biggest culprit. Basically, um, after so two things, even if you're not able to read, it's not the biggest culprit anymore. Uh, and the number reads 0 0.01 MB. Um, CPU profile biggest culprit 4940 milliseconds. After it's not even in the uh, list of suspects. Um, so. Future work, right? This is what I was talking about. Now, the limit continue thing I told about, uh, currently it just gets served from LCD no matter what. But right now there's work that uh, we're doing that basically evolves the watch cache in a way that you can serve list requests as well rather than going to LCD directly. Uh, and the way that this sort of works is the store I talked about earlier. Rather than making it just like um, a Golang map with a lock on top, you sort of make it like a B tree which sort of keeps track of what's happening. So the easiest way to tell it, tell what's happening with the B tree is you are basically making a poor human's copy of etcd in watch cache. Uh, so that's what's happening. And the reason for using the B tree is because uh, the B tree library which Golang has, like the Google one, which is relatively more used, that gives us copy on write semantics. So if you are to clone this tree again and again, which we are required to for the implementation, you basically end up copying pointers and not the entire data structure itself. So like, uh, this will further reduce log contention, hopefully reduce memory consumption. But uh, on the initial POC, what I did find out after a few profiling runs and benchmarking was it increased memory consumption. So like, need to fine tune that a little bit. Let's see how that goes. And the serialization, deserialization I was talking about. Uh, caching it at the watch so you don't do it redundantly. That's hopefully going to happen in the next release or two. So the API server, uh, there's a lot of scalability work happening there, uh, especially from the viewpoint of um, memory footprint and making it more predictable. So uh, exciting space to like keep an eye out for. Um, and yeah, it's like a fun, uh, fun thing to be a part of. 
So a few references. Um, if you want to understand how watches itself work, there's a great talk. It's called Life of Kubernetes Watch Event. Um, the PRs that implemented the change I talked about are also linked here. And the tracking issue for future work, in case you want to follow along, is linked here as well. So um, in case it's of interest to you, this is where you can find more info. And uh, thank you for attending and listening. You can reach me on Twitter or the Kubernetes Slack. Always happy to help out with questions uh, about this, about Kubernetes, about contributing to Kubernetes if you're interested. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, I think I'm. Thank you. Speaker of this session, little introduction about Mercari. So it's not just a safe pitch. I want to really uh, introduce what is the problem we are facing in my team. So mission uh, in Mercari is to create value in a global marketplace where everyone or anyone can buy and sell. So you can imagine what is kind of scale we want to, we want to tackle. In Mercari, we already started this mission seven years ago. Uh, we are just present in Japan and the US, but we want to really go global. And uh, there are little steps we are doing. We have multiple business. There is Mercari, that is the main business, C2C marketplace. There is Merpay, FinTech, to make your payment in the marketplace. There is Mercari US, similar to the Japanese one. And there is Mercari Shop, that is actually a B2C marketplace. We are also launching crypto, uh, that is quite interesting, NFT and so on. So today I'm going to focus on in Mercari, uh, because it's actually uh, my company where I'm, and the business I'm following. So Mercari is the first uh, unicorn, the first Japanese unicorn in the tech space. And uh, we are basically solving the C2C marketplace problem. So we have user exchanging their belongings, um, usually second hand. And why it's so successful in Japan is because people take care a lot of what they belong in. When you buy something second hand in Japan, it's almost brand new. Uh, the business model, we act as a kind of man in the middle. So we take a fee, uh, but we make the transaction super safe. We have uh, many nice features that simplify the interaction. You take a picture of your item and the description is auto-generated. You take a picture of barcode of your product and the, the, the listing is automatically generated, it's pretty easy. So that is uh, like the key of our success. Since the beginning until this is 2021, we have 2.5 billion items in the marketplace. Can you, can you imagine the size? And we have 20 million active users monthly. We also estimated that actually there is potential for additional 36.1 million users. The scale is big, it is growing super fast. So why in this context metadata is important? Let me try to simplify the problem statement. So this is a transaction. In the middle we have an item, what we call an item. We have a seller that is selling and a buyer is buying. Easy, you, you can accomplish your mission. But the reality is that there is a marketplace. This marketplace is full of items. Seller cannot sell their item and buyer have difficulty to find what they are looking for. So how can we help those people? Well, but in addition, what is uh, the biggest problem? The biggest problem, if I'm gonna sell uh, an iPhone, the way I'm gonna sell it is different from you, for example. You are selling the same product. In the description, I will write iPhone uh, 12, uh, mm, color black, blah, blah, blah. And maybe your listing will be, that's my iPhone. So how a buyer that is looking for an iPhone is going to do? So let's simplify. This is like a, a little blue creature. So, and those creatures are all the same, but inside they have different feelings. How can we describe those feelings? We enhance them with eyes and mouth expression. So basically, as per the metadata definition, we are describing data using other data. So we are describing emotions using uh, eyes, mouth, and so on. In this way, it, the life of the buyer is much more simplified because, for example, we can index this information. And uh, if our buyer is looking for happy items, now they can. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. In addition, uh, this is a common problem when talking about metadata. If you have an easy way to identify items, you can also understand those items. So how many of them are happy, how many are sad, and so on. 
summarizing why metadata is important. Mercari is a huge container of unstructured user-generated data. If we combine with metadata, that is actually data described data, we can improve what we call sellability. Seller can sell fast, buyer can exactly find what they are looking for, and uh, actually leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can create easy correlation. The simplest example, when you buy something on Amazon, there is also, oh, other customer bought this, other customer are interested also in this topic. So metadata helps a lot. What was our journey in my team? We literally went from zero to zero. Let, let them tell you the story. It's oversimplified story, it's much more complex than that, but I think give you a, a good understanding. So, step zero. We have identified the problem, we know that we need metadata, so let's create a new service in Go to achieve this problem. And, uh, okay, we gather the requirement, we talk a lot, uh, boring meetings with your manager, and then, uh, first of all, we need to check uh, our ecosystem, if a service that do something similar is already there. We are talking about like 300 microservices in Mercari. If everyone has a good idea to start a new microservice, it's very tricky. But in this case, we didn't find anything. So we write our design doc following our company template, and then we ask architect, uh, business analytics to review and check. But you see, the design is pretty simple. We are not uh, trying to solve uh, rocket science problems. We have items identified by the ID, and we attach metadata that we call attributes. So for an attribute, there is a value. What is an attribute? Color is an attribute. Res is its value. Step one, we use uh, uh, gRPC in our microservices. So let's start from the interface. What our service is going to provide to the entire microservice ecosystem? Again, this is basically the protobuffer representation of what I show you. We don't start from scratch when we write a microservice. We have a template uh, for Go microservices that we call Mercari Echo JP. And actually, why we are doing this? Uh, easy to develop, code structure, we try to follow some pattern, naming convention, CI settings, uh, Docker file practices, how we build our Docker image, and also common versatility code. Why this is so important? It's so important because my team, my engineers, can focus on the business logic. So we go directly to the point. And quickly sharing with you, this is like the same structure we use in all microservices. The first layer, gRPC. So basically, we basically um, translate in code what we put in the protobuffer, in the interface. So simple. Service, here we write the business logic. Okay, when we receive a request, we, this is an item, this is an attribute, is valid, is invalid, and so on. Then we have repository. These represent the entities uh, we uh, want to use in our service. And infrastructure, so it's basically the code that allows us to write in our database, to retrieve information from other SaaS services. Pretty easy. Just a little engineering on. Having the structure allows us to mock uh, for testing purposes. So I think this is pretty common. We are not doing nothing. Then we have the environment. Terraform, I think uh, uh, we mentioned this during many presentations, but this is provided by our platform team. We just write a few lines of code and we get development and production environment ready. We build our microservice pretty. Here we are not doing anything. Everything is already there. And then we want to scale. That is a very interesting about Go. So Go is an easy programming language. You can focus on the business logic. And uh, when my team work on it, actually they think about one user, one item. The business logic work, you get your request, you save it into the database. But in a marketplace with 2.5 billion items and millions of users, this needs to scale. How do we scale? Uh, Kubernetes. Pretty simple. We have some automation to create uh, the configuration. And then if we combine together, build, and scale, we basically using Spinnaker, we deploy to them or to production. We really go and uh, release our value to the final user. Last part, uh, 
This is very important. We need to operate these microservices. This is a very simplified uh, overview. Error report with Sentry, DuckDog, uh, alerting on Slack, pager duty for on call purposes. Um, again, the point I want to stress Go Lang allow you to focus on the business logic because it's a cloud native language. Then you rely on infrastructure code, SaaS services, cloud environment, and so on to make it successful for millions of users. Of course, we follow an agile process, so it's not like we write code once, we release this done. So this happens every sprint, every day. It's a continued iteration. So why the title of this section was From Zero to Hero? So we implemented our first version some time ago. And we barely reach like 200 uh, uh, requests per second. So over time, we reach like 1,500 uh, 1, requests per second. So again, go as simple, write your business logic, deploy using cloud technologies, and then you can have a lot of success. Conclusion. So co about Go in general, I just copy paste from GoDev homepage because I think it's a very good summary. Build fast, reliable, and efficient software at scale. If you think about my speech, it's basically a good summary about that. Uh, Go is coming from Google, so good name, good reputation. Is not someone in uh, I don't know in, in, in islands uh, desert in the somewhere that created this language. You are not sure if they are going to support it until next year or deprecating. So. We are pretty safe. It's easy to learn, actually. Uh, I did myself uh, uh, a good uh, Golang experience, like 12 years of experience with Java, moved to Go. In two weeks, I was able to push Go to production. Um, library ecosystem, this is pretty, uh, pretty convenient. For my team, uh, simple problem, big scale. I mean, we are talking about metadata. You have an item, you have attributes, color, red, we want to make this a relationship. <coughs> is it rocket science? I don't think so. So go here, the problem is like, how do we do this for 20 million users? How do we do this for 2.5 million um, hikers? We can quickly deliver value, and incrementally uh, cover more and more. It's easy to expand, and here I can share how our story. So at the beginning, we were not expecting high traffic. We were storing the schema definition for our metadata on files. So, OK, we need to deliver next week. What do we do? Let's save the relationship, the schema definition that define the relationship on file. That's work. When we reach a critical uh, amount of user, we need to move to the database. But we didn't have to write a lot of code. We just use Go uh, libraries and more. Um, and uh, last one, perfect for newcomers, as it was for me. I recently have an intern in my team. Knowledge of uh, Golang, almost zero. One week, he was pushing code to production and eating 20 million customers. 